Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name's Karen Ferguson, and I'll be your MC this evening. Um, firstly, before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please note that the exits, there's one either side here, through the kitchen or back out through the foyer where you arrived. Um, and also, before we start, if you haven't already, I'll just remind you to please turn your phones to silent. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know me, as I said, my name is Karen and I'm a proud Yorta Yorta woman, forever connected to my country and identity through my Cooper and Charles bloodlines, two of the original family groups comprising the Yorta Yorta Nation. I hold multiple roles across the community, including a research advisor to the Kayala Institute, board member, player and coach for the Rumbelara Football Netball Club, and research fellow at the University of Melbourne. And it's my honour and privilege to introduce the 2022 Dungala Kayla Oration. Let me start first, however, by acknowledging the elders in our community who are here tonight. We are guided by our elders and their nanyak, and it's always a privilege to welcome senior members of our community and be in their company. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge and pay tribute to the passing in March this year of Dr Moana Jackson, our 2018 orator. Dr Jackson was an esteemed lawyer specialising in constitutional law, the Treaty of Waitangi and international Indigenous issues. He was a prominent advocate and, advocate and activist for Indigenous rights, including leading the working group that drafted the United Nations... Sorry, I just get railing to read the rest of this. The United Nations Declaration. I'm useless without my glasses. <laughs> um, sitting as a judge on the International Tribunal of Indigenous Rights in the 1990s, he was a captivating orator, a special guest on our country, and left with us his rich story interwoven family culture and knowledge transfer, which will be remembered fondly by us. It feels very fitting and appropriate that this 2022 oration is to be delivered by Dr Jackson's countrymen, this time on the universally important theme of the significance and centrality of education to our culture and future. The Dangala Kaila Oration is a prestigious and influential annual event co-hosted annually by the Kaila Institute and the University of Melbourne at the home of the Great Rumbelara Football Netball Club. This is the 14th annual oration, each one helping to set the regional and national agenda in Indigenous affairs. The orations have rolling themes examining culture, education, climate change, economic and regional development, legal issues, health and society. The overarching theme of the oration, the invincible spirit defining the future, exemplifies what makes our people, the Yorta Yorta of the river country, so strong, proud and resilient. It also highlights our determination to look to the future to build shared prosperity through sustainable education and economic development initiatives. I want to warmly welcome the University of Melbourne's continuing support for this annual event and acknowledge the partnership with Kayla Institute that has achieved, amongst other things, the creation of pathways for further and continuous education and professional development in our community. I would like to acknowledge Professor Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Professor Marcia Langst Langton, Associate Provost, Unimelb, Associate Professor Shawana Andrews, Director of the Post Centre for Indigenous Health. Two uh, DVCs who are with us tonight, Pip Nicholson and Gregor Kennedy, and Barry Judd, Pro Vice-Chancellor, Indigenous. We also have a number of dignitaries and special guests in attendance tonight. And while it would take too, uh, too much time to acknowledge everyone, can I particularly acknowledge uh, our Mayor, Mr Shane Sarley, and our first Aboriginal uh, councillor, Greg James. I'd also like to um, welcome Sam Birrell, the member for Nichols, and Ro Allen, the commissioner for um, Equal Opportunity. Tonight's oration will, of course, be delivered by Professor Wiramu Doherty, a distinguished leader in Maori education. 
Before I formally introduce Professor Doherty to deliver tonight's oration, there are important cultural practices that we need to acknowledge and observe. And I'm really pleased to introduce Uncle Cole and Dixie to perform the smoking ceremony. And Belinda Briggs will say a few words to explain the importance of land and language in sustaining Yorta Yorta Nanyak, or Invincible Spirits. While Uncle Cole and Dixie are conducting the smoking, I'd like uh, for all of us to take a moment to acknowledge and reflect on the loss experienced by many of our families and community of late, so that we may appreciate this moment being here together tonight. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Colin Walker, a senior member of the Yorta Yorta Nations. I welcome you here on a Waka Walla land and water. And I hope you have a good night. And uh, it's very interesting for me to listen to. And thank you very much. I won't say much more, but this young lady will say what we have to say. <laughs> Kanya Yoboga, Ngata Belinda Briggs, Yinigunya Dangala, Kailawaka, Yini Yenbana, Motrubin Walithika Yoti Yota. Good evening all, my name is Belinda Briggs. My home is the Goldwyn and Murray River country. My ancestors Moira and Walithika of the Yoti Yota. Thank you to Dixie Patton for cleansing the room with smoke of the gum leaf and to Uncle Colin whose invaluable wisdom and knowledge is always cherished. It's a privilege to share this moment with you both and be part of this offering to our elders, family, community, and guests, or you guests here this evening, including our special guest, Professor Wira Mudawadi. It's been a privilege and honor to host you here on Yorta Yorta Walker over the last couple of days and share in such rich conversation. Some people call what I do a welcome, others an acknowledgement. I think of it as my role to introduce you to country and country to you through me. Country being not just the physicality of the land, but all that it encompasses from the past to today and the thriving connectivity of our relationships, inclusive of land, water, sky, animal, plant, and to each other as Yorta Yorta people. This place I draw, draw from is known as Nanyak, and it's the essence of who we are in relation to everything. It's a gesture that orientates us and locates us here together, giving us context to our relationships, relationships to the land under our feet, the cultural, social and historical significance of this room that we're in, and to each other, personally or professionally, this practice is intended to give visibility to each of us in relationship to place and each other, setting a foundation of common values from which we may then continue building respectful relationships and enjoying the fruits of whatever that may be. The following words are not said without mixed emotions of joy, grief, resentment, pride, profound appreciation for their fragility and origins. My reclamation of language started in my early 20s. I'll let you guess when that was. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't until a decade later before I had opportunity to be part of the Kale Institute's language revival program, Yalka Lojba, that the fire within was really stoked with mentoring and teaching by Sharon Atkinson. I do what I can to retain what I know, but I'm yet to be at a point where I can converse freely with family and community. There are few who can. 
It has not been without sheer determination, resilience and sacrifice of my elders that I can say even these few words and pronounce them. And in the process of sharing them, connect us all to here and now, which if you haven't picked up on or don't already know, encompasses the past and future shared between all of us. Now is the tension between yesterday and tomorrow. We are bound to this land in spirit, memory and blood. Our old people's bones lay in the earth. Their spirits watch over us. And we remember them by practicing what they showed us. Love, humor, kindness, discipline, strong will, respect, integrity, their intelligence, ingenuity and spirituality. In their own right, they were master craftspeople, songwriters, singers, dancers, designers, doctors of medicine, biology, astronomy, engineers, law keepers, teachers, warriors, and more. Adept students and practitioners of the law of our creator spirit, Miami, the land, its waterways, and everything that belongs. This is who we are, our being, constituted by the continuity of this web of deep connections made of family, land, waterways, animals, plants, the sky, and everything in between, stretching into the deep past and already written far into the future. This is our belonging. This is what we take, this is what we want to take into the future. Those things that tell us who we are, where we are from, where we are going, how to get there and what with. Now, Dana Dana, Dayo Waterman Wakan Clitheban, Dongoji Akapna, Yoriora Lechpan, Mumanya Ganyaji, Lech by Yoriori Embana. Ninak Nita de Emalan. Mumma Dama Dama Galnian, Yakaramja, Nyoand and Damala Yenbana, Irokurukara, Yenbana Binuruwaka Yanabanga, Dona Daya Wamarman, Yori Uruwaka Bapara Banarak, Nana Nangari Damana Nina Yanambura. I stand here upon the lands of Kalithaban, big family, the Yori Uta speakers. It gives me joy to say, in the language of my Yori Uta ancestors, we are gathered here this day, give love and respect to our elders past and present, and ancestors born of this country that lived and walked here on Yori Yori country since time immemorial. We remember them in our hearts. Thank you. to introduce tonight's co-host for our event, uh, Mr Paul Briggs, the Executive Chair of the Kale Institute and founding President of the Rumbelara Football Netball Club, and Professor Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne. To many of us here in the Dungala Kaila region, also known as the Golden Murray, Paul Briggs needs no introduction, but for the benefit of those who are new to our region or who might be viewing it online tonight, suffice it to say that Paul is a pivotal figure in our Yorta Yorta and indigenous, indigenous communities. He's both an intellectual leader and a cultural mentor. He has worked tirelessly over many decades with a single-minded purpose to restore the rights and standing of our Yorta Yorta people. It's his drive and energy that has enabled influential institutions like the Kaila Institute and the Rumbelara Football Netball Club to be established and continue to thrive and take up their rightful places in our broader community. He has been instrumental in the development of the Manara Centre for Regional Excellence and has co-chaired the Golden Murray Regional Prosperity and Productivity Plan, which shifts responsibility to the whole region in restoring a thriving First Nations economy, which will create shared prosperity for everyone, while honouring the social, cultural and economic contribution Indigenous people bring to the region. Similarly, Professor Duncan Maskell has been a strong and influential supporter of the University of Melbourne's foundational role in partnering with our Aboriginal community in our region. He brings a personal commitment to the opportunities education can provide and also brings uh, insight and leadership to the evolving partnership at the Manara Centre of Regional Excellence, which will commence operations in 2024 as a transformational First Nations-led institute for pathways, training and higher education. I welcome you to the stage.
Thanks, Kurt. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome here tonight. Um, and good evening to all of you uh, watching this um, event, um, this recording of the 14th Dungala Kiala Oration. Um, the Kyle Institute is proud to be here tonight at the Rumbleara Football Netball Club, co-hosting with Professor Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor at the University of Melbourne. A, a credible, an incredible partnership that emerged something like 20 years ago with the development of the School of Rural Health here in Shepparton and our role in bringing the Department of Rural Health to Shepparton and the first Professor of Rural Health. It is helping delivering shifts in formally embedded views and behaviours of the universe of the, um, the region that we live in. We are present here tonight in the hallowed rooms of the Rumba Football Netball Club. And we thank the young people of our teams and our supporters and our people that gather around these rooms and have, um, have lunches, have dinners, um, have tuition. Um, we're present here celebrating the spirit of our young people that drives what we do. We are pr we're extremely privileged to be embraced by the spirit, by the Nanya, the spirit that emanates from this deadly institution. Without this club over the past 26 years, the spirit and energy driven by social and cultural celebrations, the gathering of teams of young people, of mentors and role models and leadership driving our achievements might not be present. It's a gathering place for cultural affirmation and cultural celebration. I wish to pay my respects as well to my ancestors and elders who endured and continue to endure the acts of dispossession that delivered poverty to Yorta Yorta and other First Nations peoples. With pride, we carry the legacy of values and leadership. History will show my people have endured with defiance and compassion and the invincible spirit of resilience. In particular, when we talk about the Cumbrangunya Invincibles, we talk about the great sporting teams, the cricket teams, the football teams that were in the late 1890s through to the 1930s and all of the champions that have come since. The Rumbleara Football Club owes its, its place to the history of, of those teams and of our uncles and grandfathers and fathers that played across those teams and who were ably supported by our aunt, aunties, grandmothers, etc. Thank you, Uncle Cole, for being here to welcome our people. He carries, Uncle Cole carries much wisdom and knowledge and authority in the Yorta Yorta space with us. It's not so much about what he says, but just his presence gives us the authority and the strength to do what we do. I, I'm thankful for the fact that I grew up alongside Uncle Cole on Cumbergunge Aboriginal Reserve and as a young man witnessed, as a young boy witnessed um, the Uncle Cole in his role with his family and he still, um, he didn't actually mention it, but his marriage to Tanati Faye has been a long, a long-standing um, commitment an endurable commitment to family and love and compassion. 66 years. 66 years. Wow. Well <laughs> and thank you to Dix Dixie Patton, a past player and leader of the Rumbleara Football Netball Club, carrying our spirituality and bringing into our midst the cleansing ceremony of the smoke and the gum leaves from the Bayalas. Thank you to Belinda for acknowledgement of country in the beautiful language of our people. Um, it's it's uh, magic. It's a language that has, that has its roots in the whispers and sounds of the lands of the Yorta Yorta. It's grown over tens of thousands of years, 50,000 years since time immemorial. It's grown from the words, from the sounds of the trees, from the sounds of the rivers, 
from the sounds of the animals and it's grown with the people. This language has reverberated along the river and streams and lakes since time immemorial. Our language went silent for the past 160 years, but not forgotten. To hear it spoken is to lift our spirits. It's a gift from our ancestors and it signals the promise of a future in the re-emergence of our language. Karen's already acknowledged dignitaries there, but let me welcome all First Nations peoples in the room and their friends, with a special welcome to elders from other nation groups that are here, that are, that are here on your, your country. I wish to formally welcome my co-host from the University of Melbourne, Duncan Maskell, Professor Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor, and the team from the University of Melbourne. I particularly welcome Professor Marcia Langton, Australia's leading academic and a powerful warrior for our people and the future of Australian society. It's a little over 12 months since we launched the Goldman Murray Regional Prosperity and Productivity Plan, focusing on achieving parity of life, expect life expectancy and a quality of life for the Yorta Yorta and other First Nations peoples. This includes the creativity and achieving the high standard of regional livability, cultural expression and cultural affirmation. We are intent on changing the narrative from a cost model of crisis intervention that we've been wrapped in to an investment model, a rights model of prosperity and productivity. It's nearly 13 months since we launched, launched that plan here in the rooms of the Football Netball Club. To do that, we need the right policy and investment leaders, levers to be acknowledged, designed and activated. We are most, also most honoured tonight to have with us Professor Wiramu Doherty. He's here, Professor Doherty is here to talk to us about the collaboration and the integration of Indigenous knowledge with Western concepts of, of um, community and Western concepts of education. Um, he's, he's here to give us the opportunity to learn from how his institution has approached it. And I think we're on a, the start of a, quite a, an inspirational journey over the, next, over the next while with the development of the, the, the Regional Prosperity Plan and the Manara Regional Centre of Excellence. This, this institution is an Indigenous-led, committed to the principles of Indigenous knowledge, embedded in the mainstream curriculum as a means of protecting and securing the future of Indigenous peoples. This is the basis on which we will approach the Manara Centre for Regional Excellence and the Manara Academy. We are deeply committed to and have embedded in the need for change and the actions to create change. The state of Victoria is progressing on the approach to treaty and the process of unravelling the truth of history through the Yuruk Truth Telling Commission. It's a challenging journey for us and it will no doubt um, cause some challenging conversations to take place over the next while. Now we have to resource ourselves um, to be able to be involved in those conversations that are occurring. This is occurring at the same time as we approach a referendum establishing a federal voice to parliament. Should the state, the region and the state and the Commonwealth embrace the plan of the regional prosperity, challenging ourselves on, and this region on achieving parity on life expectancy is a, is a minimum of engagement. But it's, it's not my plan. It's not the Institute's plan, it's, it's the region's plan. It's got indicators in it, it's got strategy that's been driven by our conversations, but it needs to be embedded in the way in which the culture and behaviours of this region operates. 
the plan is built on the premise that you ought to people have a right to an economy and a way of life that is commensurate to pre-invasion. This approach is a change in the narrative from siloed approach of crisis intervention where we have to measure our deficits and then make submissions to the respective governments to try and meet those deficits. It's an approach, an investment approach for a prosperous and productive future. This strategy promises to deliver a minimum of $150 million per annum increase in regional um, GDP by 2035. Now, that's, um, that's the, the science and economics of Deloitte's Access Economics and KPMG Australia in talking to what's in it, the right, the win-win of challenging our region to be the best region that it can possibly be and provide a future for your order peoples. The Manara Regional Centre of Excellence, which we're partnering with Melbourne University, is a critical enabler in our research and implementation of Indigenous knowledge into mainstream curriculum and the professional workforce development of education sector and the teaching workforce. It will also deliver skills and professional workforce development that is being projected in the future needs of industry in the Goulburn Murray region. It will have at its core First Nations leadership and knowledge systems and will increase our approach to ensuring cultural affirmation and cultural celebration is central. It's an exciting time. We, we think we may go to turning the sod by the end of um, October. So the, the build process will start. Um, in welcoming you all here tonight and you know, talking about the future of, of um, aspirations of our region, um, talking about the sorts of things that are happening at the state level with treaty and with Uruk truth-telling processes. And, and Marcia has been one of the driving forces behind the referendum and the approach to a, a, a voice to parliament. Um, it's heady times and it's a challenging time for a very the infrastructure base of our communities to engage. We're engaging off the infrastructure that's designed to meet crisis interventions, not, not to meet policy levers and not, to, not to, um, to drive the social and cultural celebration models that we need in our communities to, um, to help us resolve us, resource us to be resilient in this approach over the next 5, 10, 15, 25 years. Um, so it's a, it's a change in strategy thinking. I welcome Professor Wiramu Doherty here to the Rumbelow Football Netball Club, to the Kyle Institute and to the lands of the Yorta Yorta and looking forward to your oration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for introducing everything earlier in such a great way. And um, I want to start by saying that I've been in this country for four years as Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, and I've met some extraordinary people since I've been here. And I must say that some of the most extraordinary people I've met have been amongst the Indigenous people I've met. And one of the most extraordinary people is Paul. And I want to pay my respects to Paul. Uh, publicly here and now. I also want to pay my respects to all the other First Nations people in the room, especially my Yorta Yorta friends and colleagues and uh, elders of all Indigenous communities across Australia and uh, New Zealand. And um, I want to also say that uh, it's an honour and pleasure to be in the same room as Uncle Cole. And uh, finally that I thought Belinda's speech earlier was really beautiful. Uh, it is really fantastic to be back here at Rumbalara. I uh, enjoy being here always. Uh, it's just a shame there's a footy match to see as well tonight, but uh, we'll be back for that, I'm sure. Um, 
I, I, I want to say to, to Karen, and also I, I saw Raleen and Tui uh, here tonight, I want to say to you and the others that it's fantastic that you um, uh, passed your PhD degrees recently. Incredibly important, and uh, you're, you're amazing, uh, inspirational role models and, and, and leaders for your communities in, in, in those in those respects. And mentors, I can't see Karen. Where is she? Over there. There you go. <laughs> and Ravi. Hi. Um, and uh, Marcia just uh, uh, whispered to me that the university is now passed through our system, which takes forever. Uh, the fact that we can now have a PhD in, in Indigenous knowledge which is uh, another really big step forward, so fantastic. I want, to, I want to just say thank you to Paul for, continuing his, uh, for his continuing and long-standing strength and leadership in so many fields with the Kayla Institute, with the Shepparton Goulburn Valley communities and in the wider Australian community too, uh, through his work with the AFL and many other organisations and groups and including my university, the University of Melbourne. Uh, and to our orator, Professor Wirimu Doherty, sincere thanks for making the journey to be with us uh, and for pre preparing what I know will be a very enlightening oration from which all of us in the, in the Golden Valley community and at my university are eager to learn. Each of the three previous Dongala Kalo orations that I have been privileged to participate in have had a distinct theme of importance for the local and national conversation. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I just missed the oration delivered in 2018 by your esteemed Aotearoa New Zealand countryman, Dr. Moana Jackson, who very sadly passed away earlier this year. But I know that uh, that too was a great contribution to our local conversation, drawing on Maori experience, and we look forward to the continuation of that cross-Tasman connection tonight. We're in. Uh, one thing that tonight's oration will, I'm sure, highlight is the absolutely vital role of education. I believe that that vital role is something which unites us all in New Zealand and the Golden Valley at universities and vocational educational institutions, and in the school system too, which is every bit as important as our tertiary sector. Every one of the educational institutions in these sectors, and everyone who's working in them, plays their part in delivering what education alone can bring. And one of the key things it can bring is empowerment for communities, as well as for individuals within those communities. The education journey for communities is something that has to be continually worked at and reimagined and supported by partners who wish those communities well. This idea is a key focus for us at the University of Melbourne. We are strongly committed to the educational journey and journeys of Indigenous people in the Golden Valley region. This is very important for us as an institution because education is our mission and in a very special way, because of the history of our relationship with Kayla and the Golden Valley and because of the potential of that relationship to, I hope, do a hell of a lot of good in the years to come. I feel and we feel that the Golden Valley is one place where we definitely want to continue to do our work and to, to do our work to the highest possible standard. On this point, I, I want to add a word about my personal commitment to this partnership as Vice-Chancellor. As I say, I've been in this country since the second half, second half of 2018 and since day one I have found the generosity, the friendliness and the unique knowledge held by Aboriginal people to be probably the most gratifying thing. Uh, an important thing in a sense that I've learned about Australia. The colonial past is shameful in many ways and it continues to play out in the disadvantage experienced by many Indigenous communities. But at the same time, the commitment to culture, to language, incredibly important language, to preserving and rebuilding and communicating traditional knowledge is extremely powerful within those communities and I find that personally very inspiring. As I look around at the photographs and memorabilia at this great sports club here at Rambalara, I feel the power of that Indigenous history, Indigenous determination and Indigenous strength through adversity. The club now, both in netball and football, is a proud descendant of the Invincibles. And while every season has its ups and downs, I'm confident there will be many more premierships to celebrate in years ahead. Maybe my team, Carlton, I was on talking to Uncle Cole earlier, might not ever get there again, but... Sport means a great deal to me, uh, just as education does. Where I grew up in North London, uh, football, of a very different code, was like the food that kept many working-class families like mine going. So when I look at the photographs of the legends here, 
of past and current generations, I see and understand the importance of Rumble Ira and, and Ash in everything that you're doing at this place. And I want to continue to be part of it. Education, as I've been saying, is a huge part of what we can work on together. And university education, as the great example of your PhD graduates shows, is one important component in building community futures. I've experienced that in my own life. I was the first in my family to go to university, and that laid the ground for so much more in my later career. In the long run, of course, it's brought me here, for which I'm very grateful. One thing that education to do for all our communities is to add power to our voice. There is a lot of public conversation right now about the new government's commitment to put the case for an Indigenous voice to Parliament to referendum within three years. I feel strongly that this must succeed, and I will do everything that I can to work for its success. As that voice takes shape in future, it will be strengthened hugely by the uptake of education by Indigenous people in every community at primary and secondary and tertiary levels. Already, there are great and articulate spokespeople for Indigenous communities in Australia, including several at my own institution, and they help guide me in the execution of my duties as Vice-Chancellor. The more that we shape and strengthen and empower Indigenous voices through education, the more bracing and effective this will be for the whole country, including, of course, most importantly for those of us here tonight, for the Golden Valley. So I'm going to end there, and I greatly look forward to learning from tonight's oration by Professor Doherty and to the ongoing dialogue that it will stimulate. Thank you very much. I'll take this opportunity while the stage is being reset to introduce uh, this set to you and it's a great honour, Uncle Cole, always to be welcomed here by you and to celebrate that connection that is longer lived here than anywhere else in the world. There is no other country in the world that can lay claim to the longest systems of education, governance, law cultural practice, the oldest music practice in the world right here. And I applaud uh, the work that was begun, I think, at the Willen Centre by my predecessor, Michelle Evans, and then carried on by me uh, in my great uh, privilege to serve there, that we are now celebrating today a PhD in Indigenous Knowledges. And I would hope that that knowledge may be acquired by the other 97%. Because the work of education that truly needs to be done is for the rest of Australia to catch up with what it is to belong on this land. Our voices are strong. I believe it's the hearing that has been a little weak. And so let us go forward together with this great university which celebrates now this PhD in strengthening the hearing of the 97% because the voices of the First Nation peoples of this land are embedded in the ground and really we just need to fine tune to hear. Speaking of fine tuning, I'm going to invite Dungala Children's Choir to join me on stage, please. Dungala Children's Choir, uh, I think there's a note on the back of your program to, to say that um, this is the group formerly known as, I, I feel like I've turned into Prince here, yeah. the group formerly known as, they are still Dungala Children's Choir, they take their name from the Great River, more recently called the Murray. I believe in my lifetime it will be once again called the Dungala. Uh, that is because of the work of people such as Sharon Atkinson, who has been uh, mentioned already, Auntie Lois Peeler, and particularly Belinda Briggs, you're going to hear her work this evening, sung here. Auntie Jerry and the others who translated those hymns and kept the language alive when it, uh, we were being sorely punished by the colonisers. Uh, we're going to begin with a song and I'm going to stand on stage 
with this beautiful choir and sing it with them. And you know these words too, please. I would encourage you to join in. If tears don't stop you, uh, please join in the singing of Bora Fera. Children's Choir began right here in these hallowed rooms and if ever there was a story that I would love Australia to embrace, it is this, that the arts and sport are not mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive and uh, I was privileged to be in Paris recently to hear our newly minted Prime Minister say these words, if science tells us how we are here, the arts tell us why we are here. And uh, that has been true of this group here today. Yukiri, I'm going to embarrass you now. This young woman here, this young girl who's joined Dungala Children's Choir across the period of the pandemic, most of these kids joined just on the, the very beginning of the pandemic years. Yukiri was uh, today, she's celebrating her 12th birthday, so please. <laughs> I, I almost met Yukiri uh, for the first time when she was sort of minus 12. In fact, uh, her mother carried her in utero to see the world premiere of Australia's first Indigenous opera. In fact, the world's first Indigenous opera by an Indigenous opera company, Pecan Summer. She was there at Westside in utero, about to be born. And uh, here is the continuity, the continuation of culture lived out through Dungala Children's Choir many generations and to our senior members. Uh, Lily and Charlize, we're so glad that you're here with us and mentoring these young members who are now going to present a couple of songs from the Dangala uh, Choral Connection songbook. The choir began here, but the programs that we developed here on country, on the country of my grandmother, Frances McGee, uh, those songs uh, are embedded in, our, in, in our, the fabric of this choir, but we've also gone other places. And this, uh, this next song that Dangala Children Choir will sing to you, Postcard from the Dreaming. Uh, back to where it all began. I'm writing to you from Gamilaroi country. So out there at Gunnedah. Gunnedah, apparently koala capital of Australia. I've been there many times. I've seen a sum total of one koala. <laughs> I don't think that qualifies them as the capital, but this... This song emerged from there. Winanali, we will listen. Winanali, we will hear. Winanali, we will know and we will remember. And sometimes language revival begins, begins with just one word or one phrase. Belinda, you and I are going to converse in our language, in our lifetimes. We're going to do that. I know it. I'm so excited for it. And I feel like I'll be a complete person when I can. Let's do this song now, then.
Yeah. Uh, look, you don't have favourites of songs or lyrics, but the voices of our ancestors are singing in this land, and that's what I'm talking about. That knowledge is still here. We want to know how to be on this continent if we want to transcend from that identity crisis that was caused by the beginnings of colonisation. If we want to really understand what it is to connect and to belong, we need to hear those voices. I've just come back from Broome, and this song doesn't come from there, but it reminded me while I was there the red dust. You know, one of the great souvenirs that you don't have to pay for when you come back from those places of Kimberley, or in this case, a song from the Pilbara, with some language that was uh, gifted to us by uh, Maitland Parker, senior Bunjama elder. And uh, Maitland Parker is, uh, is a great leader of his people there on their country. And uh, this language of the Bunjaba people tells us that if you go into the country with an open and accepting spirit, the land will not harm you. And uh, that's really good advice if you've been to the Pilbara, and I know many of you have, those gorges are sudden and dramatic, and so would be the fall if you didn't know they were there. Uh, this song, Red Dust Sky, really captures that spirit. to finish a song that was really made possible in its beauty by Belinda's work uh, on language. Um, uh, the humility of the Yorta Yorta people uh, and as you know I came home, I came home <laughs> from the story of being dislocated from family and community and when I came home language was just starting. There was a dictionary and people were learning words and many people have devoted their lives to this. But it was the humility in which everybody went about their work. Oh, such a lesson for us all to take. Because the strength in that humility is what provides the opportunity for the continuity we celebrate here today. Belinda Biramamana, returning to the nest. Uh, so you got your tissues ready there? I know it always brings a tear to your eye. Biramamana, yinya wamaraman bayala ganya gukaka, gongai dangama biramamana. The afternoon, the, the sunset light on the river red gums of Ayala is so beautiful. Uh, the crow, the magpie and the crow are returning home to the nest. Very significant for so many people, the coming home. I would want the 97% to come home because I don't think the 97% have ever really truly been home. We will help you get there. We will 
fine tune your hearing and then you'll understand. Biramamana. introduction to tonight's oration and a hard act to follow, Professor Dowie, so good luck with that. <laughs> um, so it's now my great privilege to uh, introduce uh, Professor Wiramu Doherty, the Chief Executive at Tufare Wananga, and I hope I've pronounced that okay. We've been practising today. <laughs> um, Professor Doherty will describe in his oration the role of the institute that he now leads as Chief Executive having previously served as Provost, Executive Dean and Head of School. He has a long and distinguished career in secondary school teaching and tertiary education, including as Assistant Principal at St uh, Stephen's School, then Principal of the First Maori Immersion School. He undertook research for his tribe's uh, land claims in the early 1990s, whilst completing a Master's degree at the University of Waikato. His PhD focused on Maori tribal-based knowledge with experience in imagining future education and its relevance to Maori. <coughs> he has contributed to Maori accreditation in the New Zealand Qualifications Authority Framework and chairs the new NZQ Advisory Board, the body established by the authority to ensure Maori content is used appropriately. 
We have had uh, the great pleasure of getting to know Professor Doherty over the last couple of days while hosting him on our country, and we feel really privileged and very grateful he has agreed to deliver tonight's oration. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wiramu Doherty to deliver the 14th annual Dungala Kaila oration. Kia ora tātou. Te tuatahi ki a koe te pakeke, i a koe te pāpā, nga mihi rā ki a koe. Nga mihi rā ki a koe, e whakatau nei āhau i roto i tō whenua, i roto i o wākainga. Nga reira, nga mihi rā ki a koe, pō, tēnā koe. Tēnā koe mō nga te tohu o te manāki i runa i āhau i tēnei o kōtou kāina. Nga reira, hurinu e tō tātou whare, tēnā tātou, tēnā tātou, kia ora. Uncle Colin, in my culture, you are our most precious. Our elders, our pakeke, uh, you are the, you spanned the, the time, our history, you span our present. So I want to thank you for your uh, words of welcome to me, for, to me here today. Thank you for being here. Uh, to you and Dixon, um, for those cultural practices that, that connect us. And uh, as I shared on Monday, I had the privilege of going through a similar experience. I come from a, a place that's, that's very rural and remote. Um, that there is nothing more welcoming than the smell of smoke. It is that sense of home, it is that sense of warmth, it is that place where those of you who, who hunt or walk when you're wet, you're cold, that smell of smoke is that thing that resonates with home for us. So I want to thank you, Dixon, Uncle Colin, for that welcome, that connection to space and place, which is critically important uh, to me as an Indigenous, and for you all to welcome me into your, into your communities. So I want to thank you, thank you for that welcome. Dr. Ferguson, Karen, where are you? Thank you. Uh, thank you for, the, um, for introducing me this evening and thank you for your words uh, around the, the work that I have been involved in for, for many years and um, as we go through this evening, um, hopefully we'll shed some light on that. I want to thank Belinda, your, again your words. Language is so important as one of those things that define who we are. There is Nothing more special than to hear your language being spoken. And if there's anything that we can do to help and support from, our, from the journey we have been on, we are more than welcome to, to share, uh, to learn from you, and then to help you and guide you as you, you work your way through. Again, nothing more important than seeing the span of our generations here, our youth, our universities, where we ultimately would hope they would all wind up in, uh, at some point in their time. So I want to acknowledge uh, those of you who have been helping the youth, the choir this evening, the messages in their songs are again those things that resonate with us as, as Indigenous peoples. And our connection to space and place is critical. So I want to thank you all and the Rumbalara Club, again one of the things as Indigenous is the duty of care we have as an individual is that care we have to our collective. Through the years, we've had to reinterpret what that collective is. So whether that collective is a sports club, whether it's a club that you are united in what you do, I just want to thank you. But to the Rumbalara Club, I want to acknowledge you for the work that you have done in holding these spaces and keeping these spaces and keeping the community together. And again, as I go through my welcome to Paul. Um, I was absolutely humbled to be taken on a journey through your lands yesterday, uh, from Monday as we left Melbourne. There is nothing more humbling than being taken into a place by whose home it is. So having the introduction, coming in and hearing and seeing the stories that, 
that resonate, that narrative that you have that sits over your land. I want to acknowledge you and thank you to that. Also, I think what is important to note is uh, Vice Chancellor Maskell, the University of Melbourne being here. I think your being here is significant and is important, particularly at this particular time where the Institute is in its developing stage of how it needs to move forward. One of the things that we have learned from our experience is we can't do it alone. We require support, and that support requires strategic partnerships and partners. Also what's important in there are the individuals that many of those partnerships are built on. The fact that you are here I think is significant and thank you for being here. Um, Marcia, Professor Langston, again, um, I have to be uh, transparent here. Marcia's son is, uh, is, uh, heads up my IT department in my institution. Um, <laughs> I better cut up his passport I think. <laughs> um, but Marcia, just lovely to see you. Uh, Thank you for the support that you do uh, and just keeping these spaces comfortable and open for us. Um, and again, um, Ben and I from our institution, thank you for the welcome uh, as we are here today. One of the things that's, um, one of the things that's important to us as Indigenous people is our community. So. Probably the easiest way for me is just to simply share a series of images. So what is important for me is my walla. My walla in Māori is my way, my waters. So either side of me here are a couple of images from my territory, my tribal connection. So I want to introduce my walla to your walla. So as we do these connections of our, of our spaces and our spaces and our places, so my walla and my waka to introduce them to your walla and your waka. So my word for waka is whenua. Those are the things that bind and keep us connected. So my space and place is defined by my water and my land as it is here with you. Your walla, your waka are important to you as it is important to me. So as a person of my tribe of Tuhoe and Ngātiawa, I bring forward my ancestors, my collection of my past that I carry with me to meet with your connection and your <coughs> connection to your spaces and places. So I acknowledge your waka, I acknowledge your walla, and all those who have moved in and around your waka and your walla. Your notion of nanyak is exactly the same as mine, as my wairua, as my spirit. So I acknowledge those significant spaces and places that define who we are, what we are, and how we think, and how we make decisions in our lives. Just a bit of geography for those of you to locate yourselves. Ben and I, our institution is just in this bite here. Auckland is kind of there, Wellington is down there. My institution is here. That green bit in the middle there, that green bit in the middle is my tribal territory which is Tewruwera, it's a heavily forested part of the, the North Island. I'm going to spend a bit of time just quickly talking around the tertiary context in New Zealand. So what we have in New Zealand, as you'll see there, we have got eight universities, we've got 16 polytechnics, which are the, similar to your TAFE system here, they're going through a significant change as we speak now. Those 16 polytechnics have been a war in the process of being disestablished and not too sure what the word is, but constituted into the one entity. So we've had 16 councils disestablished. We're having 16 chief executives being disestablished one CE of the entire network created. It's causing challenges. One of the drivers for it was, was to increase access for Māori, increase access for female, increase access for disability. Um, unfortunately, the systems and the changes that they are implementing 
aren't even going to touch on how we increase access for those key members of, of that uh, part of their, their community. So that piece of work is unfolding now across New Zealand, uh, and I genuinely feel for my ex-colleagues within the polytechnic sector in New Zealand. And then we have um, the three wananga. There are three of us. We are, we are distinctive in uh, what we do. I'll, I'll speak more in depth around my particular institution shortly. But generally speaking, the funding within New Zealand is centrally funded by government. Uh, we, have a, we have a fairly simple system in New Zealand. 70% of that funding goes to our universities. 24% of that goes to our, the, the polytechnic sector. And the three wānanga, we're left with, with 6%. So one of the key messages that we, we are having at the moment with our, our institutions within New Zealand is we've got significant work to do around notions of equity, equity in funding, equity in access. Moving on, outside of the funding, um, we have this particular uh, fund which was a little bit controversial when it was initiated um, in the early stages of um, 2003, and it was to put the focus on research. And those of us who came from a teaching background, we were a little bit, we were a little bit nervous because we could see it was pulling away from the core focus of teaching. And this was to reward our research, um, our researchers within our institutions. It's funded in six yearly blocks. You fund, you're funded retrospectively. So at the moment you. You, you apply, you put your portfolios forward around demonstrating what you have done within research, and depending on how well you are, you are then funded appropriately. At the moment, uh, because we've been pretty vocal around challenging the equity issues that exist in there for Māori, um, because of my vocalness, I guess for my, my thanks, I was given the opportunity of, of helping co-develop the next six years of that process with our a colleague of mine out of the University of uh, Victoria in Wellington. It's a, it's a significant chunk of money. It's, at stake is about $2 billion. And it is, use the word contestable, uh, in the sense that if you look along the bottom there uh, of the slide, you'll see that um, successively most of that money goes to the eight universities. Um, despite the fact that other institutions such as mine, such as our TAFE systems, clearly demonstrate the expertise and the work within research. Um, at the moment, I think we have not gone above 0.3% of that funding. Um, that funding is important. Um, as Vice-Chancellor Max will know that you, know, you, you need that funding to actually release your, your, your profs to do work. You need to be able to actually release them to to generate the research and do those sorts of things that then fold back in and support the, the learning institutions. So just moving on from that's that's kind of a whistle stop tour of the, the funding system of our of our institutions. Um, and not too dissimilar to here, our universities are are institutions that are focused around research, uh, can only move from degree provision forward, can't come into anything within the pre-degree uh, pre area. Um, and our universities are, from my context within New Zealand, um, we're fairly envious in that the sense that they are, they are funded on outputs, on who graduates out the other end. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that shortly. So the polytechnic sector, again, I think is similar to your TAFE system here. Um, very heavily driven from the vocational sector, um, largely around certificate diploma, uh, around the trade training um, pathways, are the significant uh, activity that our, our polytech sector um, uh, occupy. One of the, the, the challenges here, our polytech sector, when we are in the, the audit and monitoring function by our Crown, our polytech sector, our certificate and our diplomas are heavily dependent on demonstrating consumption of learning hours. So that consumption of learning hours takes a, a quite a bit of work from my institution to be able to demonstrate that. It is not a requirement at our degree level, so my colleagues within in the university sector 
don't have to demonstrate consumption of learning owls, whereas we within the, the, uh, the Wananga sector, we have to, because we, we don't fit nicely into the university system, we don't fit nicely into the polytech system, we, we span both. So at the moment, um, work is going on as we speak around how we write new legislation that informs what we, what we do and how we are with, with, our, with the Crown, particularly when it comes to the, the monitoring and, and the, the auditing. And at times, I have to say, some of the monitoring systems are, are overly, uh, they kind of border on a little bit of surveillance at times around what we're doing. So it's one of those things that, um, you know, we have to, you know, we have to ensure that we, we meet our strategic relevance with the Crown, otherwise we don't get our funding. So it's at those times as, as when do you push back on compliance and when do you simply comply. So we're in that, we're in that um, awkward space. So just as we lead up into our, our, I guess, the, how the government manages our system within New Zealand, we have a parent body, which is the Ministry of Education. Uh, it is a central agency um, across, across New Zealand, and it's largely the, it is largely the, the parent body of all decisions that are made within our education system. Um, we have a minister. Uh, it has a... Um, it is a government department in the sense that it has a minister, uh, sorry, it, was, it has a secretary, equivalent of a CE, which reports directly to the minister. So while our ministers come and go, depending on how well they are, how well they go within in elections, the secretary remains a constant. And I really feel for our secretaries of education, as you will all understand, if there's a change of minister, even the language that the other lot used, they couldn't use. They have to come up with different terms of how you describe the same piece of activity. Um, so that they, they are really, really tasked with some, some pretty difficult uh, jobs. But they're largely, they're, they're, they're in charge of our education system. They also monitor, we have three Crown entities. And the, the Crown entities are, um, as Karen mentioned, uh, one of them is the New Zealand Qualifications Fra uh, Authority. So the New Zealand Qualifications Authority is, without sort of, all is the, the, the NZQA are, are responsible, well, are interested in, is the quality assurance of our programming. Just, they're interested in, if you're saying this is what good is, they want to see that being demonstrated. So they're only, they're largely interested in, in, the, in the quality assurance. They also manage our, our formal systems within our formal schooling, our primary and our secondary schooling. They're in charge of our, uh, the New Zealand framework. So we have, we have an educational framework, which is um, coming from where I'm coming from is both, it's a positive, it kind of gives us one point to concentrate on, gives us one target. Um, but again, it's also a challenge for us because that framework is very descriptive and we are, even today, we are still not quite at the centre of that framework. We'll, and that's work to do, as I'll uh, talk about shortly. We have a, uh, the Education New Zealand Institute, ENZ, which largely is, is in, interested in our educational, sorry, international outreach for education. Um, just an interesting point here. Uh, being an eyes institution, we don't describe our international activity as international. It is described as indigenous. And the public servants in Wellington, we are largely, they, they make these decisions for us, didn't join the, the, connect the dots between indigenous and international. Because they didn't see the word international, we were left out of a whole lot of funding, a whole lot of decisions that were made about us, and now they're in, in the process of scrambling to try and, try and rectify that. And then the, the last of the Crown entities is the, um, I guess probably, the most important one, it's our Tertiary Education Commission. Um, and again, without sort of being overly glib about it, um, this entity is simply interested in consumption of ours. So they're, they're not, not interested in what good looks like. Um, for us, our, our uh, formulas work out one credit is equivalent to about 10 notional uh, teaching hours. So if I've, got an, if I've got a qualification that's 120 credits, TEC wants to see 1,200 notional hours of delivery. They're not interested in what it, how well it looked 
it, it's delivered. They just want to see 1,200 hours of, of notional delivery. So it's a it's it's a bit of a challenge with us, and we you know we're we're working our way our way forward. Um, also within there is our they decide on the funding system within our institutions. We have a component that is funded by 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 the government. We it's it roughly floats between 80 to 90 percent of the, the the fund is funded through government through the student achievement component, uh, and then the the remainder is is charged as a fee. Um, our institution, what we tend to do is cut our cloth accordingly. We, wherever possible, try not charge the fee because we know cost is one of those barriers that many of our, our community face. So we simply try and cut our cloth accordingly around the, the SEC component. Um, also within, this, within the Tertiary Education Commission, around this time, my team are, are quickly pulling together our investment plan, which is stipulates our funding for next year. So our government tries to manage its entire spend on education in New Zealand, and the way they do that is that we bid for numbers for next year. So where my landing point is for this, this year is a starting point for the numbers that I, I bid to government to fund me for, for next year. So it's a way that the, the government can keep a cap on, on the spend within our, our tertiary system. Um, it's um, from where we are. It's a little bit of a blunt. It's a bit of a blunt tool because um, it doesn't recognise the journey travelled. A lot of our students um, are involved in within our institution, and I'll talk a wee bit a bit more about that shortly. So, just what I've gone through is we've got our eight universities, our sixteen polytechnics, three Wananga, Ministry of Education, pretty all much is our parent body of all decisions that we do within, within our, our uh, tertiary landscape, particularly for my institution. We have, a particular, we have a particular challenge where if we are wanting to create a new qualification that goes up onto the framework, one of the things I have to do is a needs analysis to demonstrate that qualification is needed. There is a gap within the existing qualification framework that is not already meeting that particular gap I've, ident I've identified. So if we can't articulate the gap, we don't get the, the approval to offer the program. We can offer the program, but it will not withdraw funding from government. It also will not be recognised by our, our standard setting body. One of the good things the NZQA does for us is it helps clarify the notion of portability of qualification. So it gives some coherence to our qualification system in New Zealand, so people aren't left wondering, what is this qualification? What does it mean? How does it stack up on, with the, the other qualifications that sit across our, our framework? So while it's a, it's a challenge for us, it has got some benefits for us, because that, that portability, that currency, that coherence, is important for our learners to ensure that Wherever they move across New Zealand, the qualifications they have got are recognised and valued. So, there's a part of the, 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 the oration tonight for me is to around this point of architecture. So, I've uh, have been vocal with our government in New Zealand in the sense that our primary, our secondary, and our tertiary education has got an embedded architecture in it that leads and builds the workforce for the workforce development that the country requires. So that, that synergy, that architecture, is working well. Until it gets to looking at what we want to do, is where things start to, to come a little bit, uh, a little bit unstuck. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So just moving into my institution, these Ben and I's institution, I think Ben is sitting in the just in the second row there somewhere. Um, so as I saying, this is our, our, our home campus within Whakatane. We're just in that bite of the top of the North Island. Um, we're a unique institution. Within the three wānanga, we are a unique institution. We are unique in the sense that we are named after an ancestor. This ancestor here uh, was alive 900 years ago. 
um, and was very active around uh, all parts of New Zealand. Many, many tribes in New Zealand connect to him through whakapapa, through genealogy, and that was important for us. So we're not an institution that is named after a region. We're not an institution that's named after some activity. This institution was deliberately named after this ancestor. So all of our students who come into the institution need to be aware of who that ancestor is. And part of that, it, it then begins to moderate people's behaviour within the institution. The other component around this institu institution that makes it unique is that we offer the entire range of provision. Unlike the polytech sector that can't get into the postgraduate, we can. Unlike the universities who can't go pre-degree, we can. While it runs the risk of us being careful that we don't stretch ourselves too thin, what it enables us to do is start where our students present themselves. So wherever they present themselves on the framework, and sadly we have many, many students who present themselves into our institution who have no formal learning. Way too many. But what it does is it gives us the ability to start them on the pathway. That pathway from zero qualifications in our framework, we go from um, one to five is largely a certificate and, and diploma. And sadly we have many who are at zero. But one to five is certificate diploma. Uh, five, six, seven is our degree provision. Uh, eight, a little bit of nine is our masters and our doctoral provision is 10. So this allows us to begin to start our students from wherever they are because we want to make sure that they've got the requisite tools in their toolkit to be successful. It also enables us to build a carefully scaffolded pathway. Should they choose to, pr to proceed through their, their learnings, they can. Um, we've got three schools. Our um, School of Graduate Studies, um, I think we probably still are, the, we host the most PhD credentialed staff of any institution. Um, I think we're sitting around 28 uh, PhD credentialed staff in the, institu in, in the institution. Um, we are quite proud of, of our PhD students we graduate through. Um, again, not to be, to be overly glib of my colleagues in, in New Zealand, we have a, we have a particular non-negotiable plank that sits under our doctoral study. And we kind of glibly call, call it we're not interested in students who are simply interested in pathological research. We're not, interest, not interested in people who come in to tell us what's wrong with us. Many people in my country get paid lots of money to, to, to say what's wrong with me is Māori. So, you know, we, we, we're not interested in that. We want them to understand what the challenges are, yes, but more importantly, where it is you would like to be and how and what is your plan to get there. So that's a lot of the... The, the, the key fundamental component that sits under our, our, our doctoral research. And it's around that transforming. It is the transforming of where we are to where we want to be. And part of that message, humbling, has um, taken us right across to the, to the west, west coast of the United States, where um, north and south of Seattle, um, tribal institutions there who have the wherewithal to purchase an education anywhere. These are very, very well healed institutions. Tribal communities, in their scan of, of what's on offer, have decided to come to Awanuyarangi, to Whakatane, to Ben and I's institution to do their study. And one of the things that has led them to, to us is around our notion of indigeneity, from my, my governance structure all the way through to myself, to my key uh, decision makers within my institution, it is purely based on an indigenous knowledge system. So that is the thing that has attracted them. And uh, at the end of September, we will be graduating two of our Native American students out of the Lummi tribe, which is just over the Canadian border, and the uh, Tulalip tribe, which is a little bit south uh, from there, with three or four uh, Native Hawaiian students from... from um, the island of Maui and, and Oahu, um, along with our, I think we've got eight or nine of our domestic PhD students. 
So it's quite humbling to see the reach that we have within this institution across to those communities uh, around how we are developing and we are sharing stories, as is Paul and I have been doing over the last couple of days with Belinda and Karen, that the connection between us, the similarities, we have more in common um, than what we don't. You know, and those points that are in common are the things I think we need to, we need to spend more time on. We have our School of uh, Undergraduate Studies, is what you would see as you would expect to see in an undergraduate study program. We've got our Māori uh, nursing, uh, our teacher ed programs, our Māori performing arts, our humanities. Um, that one was, a, was an interesting one, um, Duncan. Our, my colleagues, my ex, my, my mates from, from my, where I used to work and who I studied with, um, they got a little bit bolshy with us around. We were writing this degree, we were calling it a Bachelor of Arts. So the university said to us, we own that title, you can't use it. So we, we took the path of least resistance at that time and we called it a Bachelor of Humanities, which we probably think is a better fit for, the, for it. <laughs> um, but, you know, Ben and I, these are the things Ben and I are having to, to fight our way around. We've, we've still got a pending high court uh, case with, with my mates at the university who got a little bit cross with us being described as an indigenous university because the term university in New Zealand is a protected term. So we're, we're, we're working our way through with my mates. <laughs> um, they're, they're getting there. Um, and then the last school is, is the school of iwi development. So iwi is our word for tribe. So our iwi development um, institution is probably where we see most of our most transformational shifts within our communities. Um, it is within this school we see that interface of those within our communities who have no formal learning. And by now there, would, there, would, there is easily between 50 to 60,000 people that have been through this program. And it's 50 to 60,000 who have not had a positive experience in our, our, our learning institutions in New, Ze in New Zealand. So what we have done is we've engaged them in through a, uh, an adult community education program. There is no formal um, uh, assessments in, this, in, the, in the suite of programming. But what we have done is we've been, quite, uh, we've been quite cunning as to how we actually fold in literacy and numeracy. If we make literacy and numeracy the, the focus, then it, it kind of it raises people's anxiety levels. And you know, those of us who are in, in here who are learn, you know, who are educators, you know, if someone's in that heightened state of of um, anxiety, you're not in a very good space to, to learn and engage. You need to be able to relax, get people comfortable. So what we've done here is, is um, we've been doing this work for a wee while, and because we was we were producing high numbers of success in there, uh, the Tertiary Education Commission were interested to see what we were doing that was different. So they gave us a wee bit of money to do some research in there. Um, we took the money for the research, but we had kind of already knew what the, what the drivers were, but however, we, we, we took the money, we, re we produced a report for them, which is what they wanted. Um, and one of the things that we knew, and we were, had it confirmed when we, we interviewed a large selection of them, it was... Um, where things were taught was important, who was delivering it was important, and what was being delivered was important. And what we had done with this program in our rural and our remote delivery was we intentionally took the delivery out to their community centres. We put them into their, into our, our traditional places of, of where we engage our community practice, which for us are our marae. So we took the learning into those, those, um, those familiar places which they already were able to, to resonate with. Who was doing the delivery? We ensured that the people who were doing the delivery were their own. We ensured they had the right wherewithal, the right qualifications to be able to do the delivery. And the content was taken from their own content. It, was, it wasn't, you know, don't teach me about my culture, teach me through my culture. So it was using that notion of, of pulling those things together where it was important for them. They could see themselves reflected in what good looked like. So then all of a sudden, 
There was no focus on literacy and numeracy. They just simply wanted to be able to coherently say who they were, coherently write who they were. And all of a sudden, they could see, we can do this. And when that belief, even, you know, how often, as we would know in here, how often you tell our ones that you can do this, obviously the, you know, it, it's the, the negativity kind of tends to take over and it's, it's a little bit hard to, to come back. But when they experienced it, then they saw the success. And then from there, they just simply excelled. And as a result of that, you know, we've had multiple generations of, of families graduating together. We've got a mum and daughter here, mum and daughter here, you know, quite proudly graduating at the same graduation with their PhDs. Um, <laughs> talk about the rivalry between mum and daughter, <laughs> but proudly two Māori mum and daughter graduating with their PhDs at the same, same time. This one here, we've got dad in the middle and, and his two daughters. So dad in the middle and daughter number one graduating with their masters. Daughter number two with her PhD. Māori families who our system, if you were to believe the statistics, would show we're not interested in learning. So again, if you get that context right, if you get that delivery component right, you can show multiple examples of where, where things are, are being successful. So, you know, iwi development is a, is a key cornerstone for our institution of how we, we're beginning to unravel that architecture I, I talked about and I alluded to, to earlier. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna jump for a second from there. I'll, I'll come back to these things. Um, in the, the briefing notes I was given for, for um, the oration today, I was doing a bit of a, an analysis across the region. Um, one of the other things I do outside of my day job, um, within our region we have got three councils. Each council has an economic development agency which is supposedly helping inform the council that our local government has to where they should spend and what they should um, concentrate their, their resources on. So three councils where our institution sits have decided to combine the Economic Development Agency for the three councils, uh, and I chair that, that agency for our, our three regions. So I get, a, I get an interesting line of sight into, into three councils and, and to see some of the, the challenges that sit within them. And what I've noticed just population-wise, uh, we're, 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 we're a similar size to your campus being. So as you've got here, um, just running down there, you can see what our, our population um, and what our, our statistics are saying about, uh, about my region. So Whakatane is where BNNI's main institution sits, and there's our national figures there, just to give you a, just to give you a comparison. Um, again, our, uh, a bit of a, a snapshot of our of our household incomes. Again, doing that comparison between um, my local region and our national region. Um, just an interesting observation. We I we did this just as we were doing a little bit of work um, as I was hop as I'm making my way over here. Is that um, our region? Um, interestingly, our um, our regional growth. We're we're tracking at about 1.1 percent, um, as opposed to our national growth, if you can call it a growth when it's going backwards, but that's what they, what they say to me, do you still call it? So our growth is, you know, <laughs> we're growing at minus 1.2%, so how the hell do you do that? I've got no idea, but that's what the economists tell me. Um, but one of the interesting things that we think what's, what's driven that bit of a shift is, um, like your country, um, our, our, our government, in its response to try and maintain the stimulus in our industries around the, the disruptions of COVID, there are all sorts of interventions given into our local communities, and we think that's probably what's pushing our numbers up a little bit around the 1.1% uh, around our, our regional growth. So, not to dwell on that uh, too long. So just to come to a couple of observations. So a couple of observations around... Um, so number one, my region, Ben and I's region, we have a growing unemployment population. Um, employment is available. And that's a frustrating thing for me as I sit across these three councils. We've got significant employment available. 
One of the issues we have is the salaries that the employment generates is a little bit out of step of our housing market. So the, the, the income that they generate from their jobs is not, big, not great enough for them to be able to purchase a home in our region. So our, our affordability of housing is just... You know, we're we're at, a, at a ridiculous place in New Zealand where it is cheaper. Our, many of our families who are renting, they would be paying less if they were paying a mortgage. But the issue they have within New Zealand is our lending conditions were that tight that it's darn near impossible to be successful in, in securing a mortgage in New Zealand. So it's one of, the, one of the challenges we have at the moment. It's getting people into affordable homes. The other thing we have is that we've got employment. We've got a large number of people who want to work. It's not that these, these ones don't want to work. And what we have is we've got a... We've got a gap between the skills that they have and the skills that the employment is wanting to, um, to engage with. The other observation is that we've, got a, we've probably got the highest population of Māori across all New Zealand uh, in our region, um, just under the 50-odd percent. We have the highest figure of families who earn less than $20,000 a year. How the hell you live on less than $20,000 a year? I've got no idea. But we've got the highest percentage who are in that income bracket. And again, as I'm saying, we've got the highest levels of unemployment. Now, I'm going to jump back to this comment I made earlier. So, the existing architecture within our system in New Zealand is not working. The fact that I've got a large population that sits within the three councils that we operate within who want to work, there is work available. There is a gap between the skill set. So the architecture that our schooling system was supposed to have done to prepare them to be employable has failed. It's failed for a large section. And again, when I joined the dots, we are high population Māori. Not all of them will be Māori, but a significant number of them are Māori. So one of the challenging things for us when I respond to, to government, all of our policy that comes through our Ministry of Education, it's premised on the notion that we live in an urban setting. When we don't, when we live rurally, we're slightly out of scope of their decision making. And when you add being Māori to that, we are just forced right out to the outer margins. We are othered in that situation. Such to the extent, as all good academics, we, we made up our own word. We created a new word, and we called it rurality. And it's the realities of being rural. So the system itself from the beginning others us. Aside from all of the cultural things which we're having to fight against, the system itself from the outset others us. You know, very similar to the experiences that I've, I've seen in Paul and the family has shared with me here today. That, you know, the experience of the Yorta Yorta in the 1820s where you were, you know, you were pushed off your homes. You were pushed out of the centre of who you were. You were pushed to the, to the outer margins. And then when we come back to our experience of looking at this high population who want work, there is work available. And then I come back to this notion of rurality these are, again, some of the challenges that we're having to, to start tinkering a little bit around the architecture that, um, that our, our education system is, is built on. So, and this is really getting to, the, to the, the crux of my oration here today. It's to, within the New Zealand context, we are challenging that architecture. We need to. What we need to be able to do is identify those things that other us, that don't put us to the centre. Identify those systemic things that simply put our interests out to the side. You know, many of my families in Fakatani, they don't want to be living on less than $20,000 in, in their homes. They don't want to be living in poverty. They want to be successful. But the thing is, out of the schooling system, if they don't have the tools in their toolkit, 
They've got limited tools in there, as my wife would say. She's a primary school teacher. If the only tool he's got in his, unfortunately, sorry guys, most of the ones who get in trouble are us. If the young fella's only got a hammer in his toolbox, why do we punish him when he uses a hammer? What we need to do is build more tools so he can put in his toolkit and be more successful. So, you know, these are some of the, the challenges we have. You know, and I've just absolutely humbled to be taken around your, your territory. The technologies that you have around using your dung, the dangala, your wala, those are the things that need to be folded into your curriculum. You know, the, the narrative that you, the yorta yorta have in surviving on this land, that technology, that awareness of what economy can be driven off your land, what are the tools, what are the skills that you need to be successful there, that knowledge you already have. And the, the, the challenge for us is how do we pull that in to be a critical part of our formal learning? Because already we know within our experience within our School of Iwi Development, if you're able to demonstrate what good looks like and they can see themselves represented in what good looks like, those are key predeterminants to be successful in our learning. You're welcome to country. There is nothing more profound than that. You know, you are the narrative, you're the voice to your, your land and your spaces. Absolutely humbled to be, to be welcomed here appropriately. So, again, you know, coming back to, to this kind of overly simplified uh, diagram here, our, our schooling system was there to ensure people had the required skills to be able to be uh, usable by the labour market. So the workforce, again, that labour market skill is the thing that helps inform our schooling. Now I can hear many of my academic colleagues will probably disagree with me on this, but our schooling system is simply there to ensure our graduates out of our schooling system can be employable. And again, that's one of the things we're having to challenge our government on, is I can make my graduates employable, I cannot make them employed. I can make them employable, give them a whole range of tools that they can apply, and it's up to them as to how they apply those tools um, to, to engage within the community. So, to me, there is a notion in here of public good. You succeed in your schooling system, that gets you into tertiary. You finish your tertiary system, and then by doing that, you then make yourself employable. You then become employed, and then you generate to the GDP of your country. You are doing your public good for the country. I argue there is such a thing that sits in there around an indigenous public good. And that indigenous public good talks around this notion of cultural citizenship. So. We have work to do in building this indigenous, aboriginal, yorta yorta, Māori public good of our formal learning systems that then help inform our labour market. So again, if we, if we look at this particular, and again, you know, apologies for my, you can see um, I'm not a graphic designer or anything, my overly simplistic square boxes, which is about the limit of my skills within, um, on PowerPoint. But if we have a look, so if we, you know, if we take the point that the, the schooling system, that architecture, is to prepare people who are readily employable by, by the labour market. So if we take the notion of the public good element, also the notion of that cultural citizenship, one of the challenges that we have and that the institution will have to do here is not only do we have to build the learning qualification pathways that grow this knowledge, this system, we also have to be able to identify and show others where the value add and the contribution it will make to the labour market. So what we need to be able to, to show is that our indigenous knowledge is something that is worthy, is something that is required by the labour market. Becoming more and more relevant now is focus on changeable weather patterns. Changeable weather patterns, we're more keenly aware of the impact of our economic development 
it's having on our environment. Part of that economic development and being aware of the, the changeable weather patterns is more of a focus on where product is, where product is produced and by whom. So the notion of changeable weather patterns, that is embedded in the Yorta Yorta narrative. Um, with Paul and Travis yesterday driving along, talking around you know, a story 25,000 years ago about how the communities were able to, to dig a channel through a particular fold in the, in, the, in the landscape to let the water back out into the communities. That awareness of your landscape, that awareness of the natural rhythm of our landscapes, the environment, being keenly aware of, of the early um, break systems within our, our, our flora and fauna, knowing if certain trees are particular dying or certain animals or insects are behaving in a particular way. These are all clues that our landscape is talking to us on that something needs to be, to be changed. That is hardwired into your Yorta Yorta knowledge. That is hardwired into my, my knowledge system. So that is a contribution we can make to those who are now talking about sustainability and impact on environment. The notion around provenance of where product is from. The minute you scratch the surface on the notion of provenance in Australia, you are back with the Yorta Yorta. You are back with your Aboriginal communities. And that, as was shared today, that connection, no one has your, your reach of history. Within New Zealand, our, our histories can go back around five 5,000 odd years. We can't talk about the 20,000, the 30,000, the 40,000 years that you do. And what is so, so inspiring is you're still here. And you're still here maintaining that connection, doing your job of ensuring you look after those places, you welcome people into those spaces. So for me, those are, those are key critical components that need to be understood as key determinants in the labour market here. And they need to be understood as notions of cultural citizenship, not about making uh, it a better place for, for our communities, but they need to be connected to, to the notion of growing statehood, nationhood. Because the minute it's talk, it talks about me within Māori, then there's the backlash again, we are giving too much to Māori. And again, it's, it needs to be understood in that notion of growing statehood. So, just to begin wrapping up here, so, you know, what are the challenges for, and, and I'm, I'm including the Kaiala Institute, my institute, you know, one of the challenges for us, number one, you know, we need to ensure our indigenous narrative that connects to space and place is understood. It is understood, it is clearly visible as a labour market driver, as a labour market skill set that's required. That then will fold down into our teaching and our learning institutions. Yes, we can pull on all of the other levers around. As citizens of this country, you have a right to have your own knowledge taught and delivered in your schools. Absolutely pull that. But those in the hard to shift places, and we all know who they are, we've got plenty in my country as well. What tends to shift them is when you can shift that argument to one of economics. And the economics is the thing that tends to shift them. Um, we need to be able to demonstrate and include our knowledge and our technologies you know, as, a, as that critical component that is, requires and enables our students to be successful in our schooling system that gets them into tertiary. Because unfortunately, you know, right or wrong, there are very few jobs that are available for our families that do not require a pathway in tertiary. There are very few. If you can't get into tertiary, your options are that much more limited. So we need to be able to, to understand. As Iwi Development School has demonstrated, if you're able to show who they are and what good looks like, it is a critical predeterminant of what success looks like in our learning. The other component is we need to put ourselves back to the centre. We need to be able to connect ourselves, remove those notions of rurality, understand what is happening around us so we can then respond appropriately. Put us back to the centre. Put us back to the centre around the key things 
that are critically important for us, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of both of our countries. Because if we can get more people being productive citizens, we then increase our GDP, we then increase all of those other positive indices start to then, to then shift in the, right, in the right way. The other component is, you know, coming back here to you, to the Yorta Yorta, your narrative that connects and explains your walla, your waka, that needs to be understood. Not only to grow Australian Inc., it also needs to be grown for the world of humanity. Your history, your lessons that you have here are things that we can all learn from and things that we can all begin to celebrate and, and learn from. So, for me, one of the key things that both of our institutions can do is we can be, you know, we're that, we're that place where you can be indigenous. You know, where indigeneity is not dialectically conflicting with academic success. Rather, it's that luminary prerequisite to achievement. These are the things that we can do as our, as our institutions, is we can show what good looks like, what our communities can see, what good looks like, and then begin to build. And also in seeing themselves represented in what good looks like, then begin to build their own pathways to shift them from wherever they are to be whatever it is they want to be. You know, our, our voices together, you know, our shared voices, again, talking about us as indigenous communities. Um, geographically, we might not be that close, but again, the point I made earlier, our points of similarity of how we define, how we express ourselves, how we record our histories are so similar, are so similar. And the more we can share in these, in these, in these stories about our, our development and how we can then move forward, one of the nervousness things around it is our elders. It's the fragility of that knowledge system we have there. We don't have the inbuilt architecture that can go on when we're not here. So the fragility of what we're talking about is still named to individuals as our points of reference. We need to build that, that architecture that gives us sustainability, that gives us the survivability of what it is that we, we are doing. And again, you know, it is, it is our narratives, your narrative, my narrative, that describes and defines our country. So just to finish tonight's oration, I want to come back to a, um, this, this point here. So what you've got here is a statement, these two statements. That one there is called Waiyo Na Waiyo. So over here... Uh, Wayo na wayo. So, and they. That is my way of asking. Wayo is who am I? Na wayo, who am I from? And this is just a, a clue, as as I was sharing with Belinda earlier today. Some of my work is about connecting our language and how our language provides an insight to the knowledge system that sits there. So, and it's deliberate. If you have a look at the top sentence, it has a question mark. The bottom one has an exclamation mark. So, this is how I ask, who am I? Kowayo. And again, this is one of the things I'm, um, this is a, a friend of mine within my tribe has come up with this saying. You know, the most common element we have is, you know, is hydrogen and oxygen which is H2O, most common element that, that exists across our, although some of the chemists here might disagree, but, you know, H2O. So when, these are, these are some of the les lessons from, my, from our, our ancients. So when I ask the question, kuwayo, that is asking, who am I? It is also a statement. In the question of who am I, I'm also making a statement, I am water. When I ask, na wayo, in my language, who am I? Who are my parents? Who am I from? I am also making a statement which says, I am water. So those two key things are some of those insights that we have within our language that connects us to our, our space and place. So again, you know, for tonight, I want, to, I want to thank you all 
for giving me this opportunity to share some of the things that we have within Aotearoa New Zealand, share some of the, the challenges and some of the stories that we have as an institution trying to influence more of that architecture. And I think with us together, we can, we can begin to le uh, lean on each other and share with each other the successes that we've had along the way and how we develop this architecture that is about building our nationhood. It's not about building Māori in New Zealand. It is about building New Zealand Inc. You get that architecture right here in, in Australia, it is about building Australia Inc. Because when you build, you get that mix right, you've got that pathway through that then generates sustainability for all of our communities, communities to be successful. We want to be successful. I want to be Māori. I want to be Tūhoi. Similarly here, you want to be Yorta. You want to be successful. So thank you all today. I thank you for listening to me this afternoon and this evening. Kia ora tata. Thank you, Professor Doherty. I think we can all agree that was a insightful and truly inspiring oration. Um, and it's really heartening to hear about the commonalities that, in, that binds us as Indigenous people internationally. Um, I'm going to invite now my colleague, Dr. Tui Crumpen from the Kail Institute um, to give her response to that oration. Thank you. Professor Wiramu uh, Doherty, I would like to thank you for your oration tonight. Uh, you gave a captivating insight into not only the Indigenous experience in the tertiary se sector, but on the power to construct knowledge itself. Who gets to construct this knowledge and how it gets imparted and or shared are some of the underlying themes I picked up on tonight. So there are many layers to this complex space I could respond to. I've picked three. The first, uh, what struck me was the 50 to 60,000 people who have moved through your institution. <laughs> uh, it speaks to the longevity of your journey. Uh, the many years of an Indigenous designed higher education system, itself an example of excellence that continues to decolonise the colonial mindset, to value the Maori first and demand that this is a prerequisite for any achievement. It is a formulated and sophisticated system designed to embrace and value Indigenous lead. Professor Doherty reminds me that this architecture speaks to a nation building mindset. The second, a most brilliant move, is to design a system that connects to the cultural heart of community, our families. Through the Marae, education is brought to where the family is. This, for me, truly shifts the mindset of what education means. If everyone has the opportunity without barriers, then imagine what becomes possible for each person. Just who is it that they can be? What is it that they can imagine for themselves? Professor Do Doherty reminds me of a time with Uncle Cole, who said to one of our Ash students, it's not how you can do it. And he went and he stood by that student and he said, it's how we can do it. You don't have to do it alone. You have a community that backs you. So the third, there's something to be said about how we know ourselves as a community, our sense of belonging. That our education journey is layered and that through a variety of knowledge systems, our many experiences, our historical legacies, the knowledge we share, we are shaped that maybe we can find the balance between our two worlds and harness all that is on offer. We, 
where we're not limited in our pursuit of having the best of everything because our First Nation right is not only to design but access any opportunity available because this is our country. As Professor Doherty once again reminds me, First Nation people are not the other. Here on Yorta Yorta country, Yorta Yorta people are coming into town, no longer sitting on the fringes in lands that are rightfully theirs, that our very own Manara Centre of Regional Excellence will remember and honour this community's legacies and give hope to our next generations, that in our pursuit of excellence that we define for ourselves, we stand on the shoulder of giants and our partners and allies continue to shape the very best future. I'd like to thank Paul Briggs, who has privileged me tonight for giving me this honour to respond and whose vision for our community and the Manara Centre resonates so strongly with the insights of Professor Doherty. I'd like to acknowledge Professor Maskell and the University of Melbourne's ongoing friendship. And I say friendship, not partnership, because that's what it's been, a friendship. Once again, I'd like to thank Professor Doherty for his powerful contribution to this continuing narrative about reimagining our place in the Golden Murray. <laughs>